Hey y'all and welcome to our second video for our Advent series, The Character of the One Who Came. I'm Erin Warren and I'm so glad that you are studying along with us, um, studying scripture through the lens of the character of God or the character of Jesus is one of my favorite ways to study scripture and it has been so life-changing for me. Um, we are using John 14, 6 as our key verse for this study. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the reason why we're doing this at Christmas is because Christmas and Easter are really intertwined. Um, the hope of the baby in the manger is, is more about um, the hope of of our savior on the cross. And so the two um, are connected and um, it is um, so paramount that we look at Christmas and understand Christmas through the lens of Easter and through the lens of the cross, that Jesus is the one who came. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Um, so our first week, we focused on that first characteristic that Jesus is the way. And we went um, to Hebrews chapter 10 um, and, and studied how Jesus is the way and the way maker. Just a quick review from the last um, session, we talked about the definition of the way that it literally, the Greek word means road. Um, that Jesus is the only road to a relationship with Jesus. Um, <laughs> Jesus is the only road to relationship with God, our Father. Um, you have to keep in mind at the time when this was written, um, the only way to have access to God was through what was called the temple, or um, it was originally established in the wilderness um, in the tabernacle, which was just a um, a traveling version of, of the temple, but it was a series of sacrifices and cleansings to cover the sin of the people so that God could dwell in their midst. Um, and God's glory dwelt in the Holy of Holies, um, within this tent and within the temple, but nobody was still allowed into the presence of God. And so, um, Jesus being the way is not just about the forgiveness of our sins. It is about the, the whole process that allows us to um, have that restored relationship with our father, that the tabernacle and the temple um, were mere shadows is what the author of Hebrews calls it, that would point us to what Jesus would ultimately do. Um, and that is what we dove into um, this week. Now, Jewish tradition would call the path toward righteousness the way. So when Jesus said he is the way, that is something they would be very familiar with. And it would be this understanding that he is the one, the path toward righteousness um, that they were talking about. Um, but the reason why we don't just focus on Jesus is the way and why we also want to focus on him as the way maker is because he did both. He made the way um, and he is the way. Um, and so that is what our study kind of went through. Um, and just real quick, one last little note from last week. Um, and I think this is really important because when we hear Waymaker, it's a really popular characteristic of God right now, of Jesus. But when we hear Waymaker, we tend to think of um, very often a situation is like the Red Sea, where our back's up against the wall, where there is no hope, and how God makes a way where there is no way. And while there is, yes, some of that, that he does make a way for us through our hard circumstances, God being the way maker, or Jesus being the way maker is not about him making a way for us to escape the hard circumstances or the hopeless situation that we are in. Um, he very much, I think we often forget that on the other side of the Red Sea was the wilderness. <laughs> It's not like the Red Sea parted the way to the promised land. And so um, it's important for us to understand that the way maker is not necessarily that he delivers us from those hard circumstances, but that he is the one who made the way for us to have restored relationship with him. And that's what we saw in our passage this week. So our key verse verses were Hebrews 10, 9, 19 through 23. So I'm going to start there. 
Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, that is that holy of holies that I was just talking about, the place where no one, only the one priest could go on the day of atonement each year to atone for the sins of the people. Um, we now have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our body, bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Amen. We now have confidence to go before God only because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We, I don't know, this side of the cross can fully understand what this would have meant. Um, remember how I talked last time about it being radical, that this is a turning of everything they have believed on its head and not like a complete opposite shift, but more of a, all of these things you've been doing, they all point to me and here's how I'm going to fulfill them. Um, God was closed off to them. They did not enter into the presence of God confidently. That one priest who went in one time of year, tradition holds that they would um, tie a rope around his waist because if he did something wrong and he was struck dead within the Holy of Holies, they were not able to enter. So they had a rope to pull him back out. Um, going before the presence of God was not something that they did confidently. But now because of the blood of Jesus, we can enter confidently into his presence. We have that restored relationship with him because of the covering of the blood of Jesus Christ, that he made the way for that to happen. Um, one of our additional verses for this week, um, which I highly encourage y'all to read, um, goes a little deeper into this, and that is Hebrews 9, 11 through 28. And I'm going to go ahead and read all of it because it's just so rich with truth about Jesus as the way and the way maker. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent. So again, referring, this is showing how Jesus is the more and better tabernacle um, or the more and better sacrifice not made with hands that is not of this creation. So he is entering based off of his deity as God, not um, into a, a something that is defiled by human hands. Um, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by the means of blood and goats, um, by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, um, which are copies of the true things, Remember I said, he talked about how they, um, those are just shadows. They're copies of what meant to point us to the true thing. So copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters into the holy places every year with the blood, not of his own. Then for then he who would have, he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it was appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ has, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. If there is not, um, this I think is one of the most beautiful Christmas passages, the uh, Advent passages. We talked about Advent means coming. And we, um, 
we, in this season, we hold the tension of the already, but the not yet. The coming that came and bought for us salvation and, and that eternal redemption that the author of Hebrews talks about here, um, but also knowing that we await his return again, that his second coming we anticipate and we hold the tension between these two. Jesus opened the way. We now have a way to approach our holy God because of the sacrifice of Jesus. And what's so incredible here is that he was not just the the intermediary or the high priest. Um, Hebrews calls him the great high priest. Um, he is not only the one who interceded on our behalf, but he himself was the sacrifice, the way and the way maker. The Greek word um, used um, back in Hebrews 10 for confidence, um, it is the Strong's Greek concordance calls it the undoubting confidence of the Christian relative to their fellowship with God. We have, um, it is unwavering faith that we now have access to God through Jesus. He opened the curtain. Now, this curtain was a massive work of art that separated the holy place from the holy of holies where God's glory dwelt. Um, Jewish tradition holds that it was as thick as a hand and that it could not be torn. Um, that um, and it had it was intricately woven and it divided the presence of God from the people. And so here um, in Hebrews, where it talks about the curtain, um, it is a reference to this curtain that was in the tabernacle and in the temple, separating God's presence from his people. And when Jesus died, something absolutely beautiful happened in Matthew 27 verses 50 through 51. It says, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This curtain that was, um, that divided God's presence when Jesus breathed his last, when he cried out in a loud voice and he said, it is finished, that curtain tore from top to bottom. It was not torn by human hands. God tore the curtain. I love, I have this children's book. It's one of my favorites. It's called The Garden, the Curtain, and the Cross. And I just want to read these two pages out of it because um, it is just, I think it's one of the most beautiful pictures of, of what Jesus being the way and the way maker was. It says on the cross, Jesus took all our sin and all the bad things we do and all the sad things they cause. Jesus took them all from us. And when he did something amazing, astonishing, astounding happened. The curtain tore. God had ripped up the keep out sign. God's wonderful place is open again. Because Jesus died, we can go in. God ripped up that keep out sign. And because of Jesus, we now can enter into the presence of God. One of our other passages this week was Romans 3, 21 through 26. It says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. That's a reference that the law and the prophets, um, when you see it capitalized like that in scripture, it is a reference to what we now call the Old Testament. Um, it would have been the law, which is the first five books of the Bible and the, and the books of the prophecy um, that we have in the Old Testament. So it's saying that all of the Old Testament points us to Jesus. They all testify and bear witness of Jesus. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forth as a propitiation by his blood. That's a big churchy word that talks about the atonement for our sins. That's what the word is, what the priest would do in sprinkling the blood, that same language we see in Hebrews 9, to atone for or cover the sins of the people. Um, so whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his di divine forbearance, he had passed over the former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. 
Jesus, that idea again of the just and the justifier points us to the fact that Jesus was the just sacrifice. He was the perfect sacrifice. He was the sacrifice to end all sacrifices, that he was the way and that he is the justifier. He is the one who justifies us. Um, one of the women that is in one of my small groups um, has, just gave this great example. She had always heard justified as um, explained as justify had never sinned. And that is what the blood of Jesus does. It covers us just as if we had never sinned. He, which is what allows us to approach the throne of grace with confidence, what allows us to come before God. And so he, that is how he made the way, how he became the way maker. Um, and we are, um, it talks about here, our bodies washed with pure water. This language again here relates to baptism. Baptism was a symbol of conversion. Um, previous to Jesus, baptizing Gentiles was a symbol of their conversion to Judaism. It was this idea of, of breaking the ties of their previous um, religious life and saying they now um, are going to be part of the of Judaism and and going to be Jewish and so um, that's why when John was baptizing Jewish people it was so radical because um, they were he was saying that um, that they are buried in their old life and raised to new life through Jesus the old is gone and the new has come um, we now get to experience because Jesus is the way and the way maker, the, the covering, the justification, um, the presence of God because of Jesus. Um, he says here, we hold fast. We remember um, that word means not let go. We hold on to it without wavering. We remember who he is. We hold this hope that we have in Jesus firmly. Um, because and securely and without doubt, because we know that he who promised is faithful. He is faithful. His faithfulness means that he keeps his promises. Every single word that he has put in scripture that is promised to us will come to pass and has come to pass. Um, and, and we now hold fast to that. So let me ask you this. Do you trust his way through Jesus? Do you trust that Jesus is the way? He is the only way to relationship with God and that he is the one who made that way for us. Um, in his book, Gentle and Lowly, Dane Ortland said, we are unrighteous. He is righteous. Even our best repenting of our sin itself plagues with more sin needing forgiveness. To come to the Father without an advocate is hopeless. To be allied with an, an advocate, one who came and sought out rather than waiting for me to come to him, one who is righteous in all the ways that I am not, this calm confidence before the Father. We get to experience that. We are allied with an advocate in Jesus Christ, one who made the way and was the way. He came to us. He is the one who came. He didn't sit in heaven and wait for us to figure it out. He knew that we were incapable on our own of doing anything that would allow us to be able to enter into the presence of God and have that restored relationship. And so he did what we could not do. He did what the blood of bulls and goats could not. He did in one fell swoop on the cross what um, we could not and, and covered us in a way that created a new way to have relationship with God. He is faithful in the sacrifice of Jesus once and for all. He is seated at the right hand of God because it is finished. Because Jesus is the way and the way maker, I can approach God confidently knowing that I have restored relationship with him. Now, I want to give us a little bit of setup into this coming week. Um, remember, I talked about context is super important. So this week, we are going to move into um, the book of John. And so, um, and our characteristic is Jesus is the truth and the truth teller. 
Um, truth has a high value for me. Um, and it is interwoven into the fabric of even this ministry feasting on truth, um, if you couldn't tell. Um, so I want to give us a little bit of setup because I feel like truth sometimes gets, um, it can be sound like a harsh word. Um, and it's a word that has honestly gotten a little muddied over the last several years. And so I want us to focus on Jesus as the truth and the truth teller. So as I said, we're going to John chapter eight, um, and we have 16 verses, verses 31 through 47. So a little bit longer this week, but it's really good stuff. And I think you'll understand why um, I included the latter verses as we are, as you are studying this week. So the book of John, here's your context information is written by John. Um, he is one of Jesus's closest disciples. Um, he wrote several books within the new Testament, John, first John, second John, third John and revelation. Um, his gospel was one of the last written. Um, he, it was written probably around 90 AD. So we're looking at about 60 years after Jesus's death. Um, and John tells us in John 20, 30 through 31, his purpose for writing, his purpose is that we would believe that Jesus is God and that by believing in him, we would have life in his name. Um, and so he orders his gospel. Um, he puts stories of, of miracles, teachings of Jesus. He uses the backdrops of the Jewish feasts and festivals all to show how Jesus is God, how um, he focuses heavily on the deity of Jesus, um, how Jesus is the promised one, the Messiah, the one who is coming. And, um, and so in John 8, we are on the heels of one of those Jewish feasts and festivals, the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, at the beginning of John 8, he stands up on the last day of the feast and says, I am the light of the world. Whoever believes in me will never walk in darkness. And what's so powerful about this is that one of the key features of the Feast of Tabernacles were these massive lampstands. There were four of them in the temple and they remained lit for the entire eight days. Now, during this time, there's no electricity. And so light is a, is a very valuable commodity. Um, and if you, if you've ever been to a museum, um, that has artifacts from this time, you'll notice that a lot of the lamps are, are little lamps that you hold within your hand. Um, so light is very small. Um, and so for these eight days, there is light that basks all of Jerusalem in light, even all through the night. And so when Jesus stands up on this last day of the festival, those lights are about to go out. And they are going to have darkness covering them at night again. And they're going to be reliant on these little lamps to continue to give them light. And so when he says, I am the light of the world, you'll never walk in darkness with me. He's saying that all of this is pointing to him. And so that is what is coming, what has happened right before this. Um, and so then he explains um, that when he is lifted up, which is a reference to um, his crucifixion, that they would understand that he was true and the Messiah. And it says many believed. And this is where we are going to pick up. So I want to make sure you have that um, a and that background. But I also want to make sure we have an understanding of the definition of truth. Um, so this is not just that what God says is true. It's that he is truth. He is the complete embodiment of truth. Um, and it's the truth of reality. Um, it's an idea. It's the divine truth revealed to man. That is what Jesus is. Um, and truth is becoming somewhat of a relative term these days, as I said. Um, in fact, back in 2017, um, the Oxford Dictionary's word of the year for 2016 was post-truth. And it carried this idea that um, truth was no longer relevant. And so um, our world continues to tell us that truth is not relevant, but it's important for us to know that not only is it relevant, it's necessary. And, and truth can only be found in Jesus and in scripture. Um, and we must know truth. Um, and so if we must know truth, we must know Jesus. So yes, he is truth. 
and there is no falsehood in him that he also speaks truth. So whatever he says is true as well. And truth is so important. That's why in the armor of God, the very first thing they put on is the belt of truth because the weight of everything else um, is, is hinges on the belt. And um, it's what allows the soldier to carry the heaviness of all the army. Think like a you know, if you're um, lifting heavy things, they'll put a weight, uh, you know, a belt around the waist to add extra support to your core. Um, the truth gives us that extra support. And y'all, Satan's been asking and having us question what God says since the very beginning of time. He slithered right into the garden and asked Eve, does God actually say? So it's important for us to know truth. It's important for us to know the word. And that is what we are going to be diving into this week. Jesus is the truth and the truth teller. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I find myself humbled every time that I come to your word and see you as the way and the way maker. God, that you did not see fit um, that we should be separated from you, but and knowing that we had nothing in us to um, achieve that, that we needed you to do it for us. And, and you did, you came, you made the way, you did what the blood of bulls and goats could not do for us. Lord, we are so grateful. Lord, we continue to surrender and to be in awe of who you are, Lord. Let us never doubt that we um, are, are able to to come to you, Lord. May we always remember that because Jesus is the way and the way maker, that we can approach you confidently, knowing that we have restored relationship with you. I pray that as we discover your truth this week and we listen to your truth, God, that you would help us know that you are the trustworthy and true and sure foundation that, that holds us together through um, through life and through this in-between where we hold on, um, thanking you for the coming and, and awaiting the coming again. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.